The idea of sexual relationships between human beings and non-human beings is a, a persistent sub-theme through much of mythology. In the Old Testament it says, and the gods found the daughters of man fair, and the Persephone myth is a good example of this, where the Platonic demiurgos of the underworld ensnared Persephone. Oh, and another example that should be mentioned are the Incubi and Succubi of medieval uh, mythology. These were male and female spirits which were thought to come to people in the night and have intercourse with them, and it was very bad, very bad for health, and uh, general wasting away diseases were often explained by invoking this phenomenon. But uh, what I want to talk about is something similar but with a uniquely modern cast, which is <clears throat> uh, the flying saucer phenomenon has begun to take on this new character, this erotic dimension. Uh, there's no hint of this kind of thing in the earthly literature of flying saucers, meaning from 1947 through 1960. But now it seems to be a rising theme, and uh, I would like to talk about it, because though it uh, you know, is the darling of a screwball fringe when it's in this form, I think that it represents an interesting uh, um, developing folkway that we can learn from. So, what about it? It's only in the last uh, 60 years since the discovery of DNA and the uh, discovery of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram so that we began to get an idea of the true size of the universe that the notion of extraterrestrial life and extraterrestrial intelligence could even be coherently framed. Before that time, man's relationships with transhuman intelligences tended to be demonic or angelic and to fall into those categories of beings which occupied hierarchical levels above and below us in the in the uh, structure of being but all basically terrestrial or in some sense terrestrial but science by uh, explicating the non-uniqueness of biology and giving us an idea of what's going on in the galaxy and beyond has validated the notion that life is ubiquitous and that intelligence is a property which accompanies life and uh, is also therefore probably very common uh, in the universe. This legitimizes fantasy about the existence of extraterrestrial life. So that what is happening in the last half of the 20th century uh, is that the mythological outlines of what the alien must be are being cast now. The expectations of people living now who have been given the rudimentary knowledge of biology and astronomy that allows the thing to be conceived, their expectations are casting the extraterrestrial archetype into a mold that it will t hold until uh, it is disconfirmed or confirmed by true extraterrestrial contact, whatever that means. In other words, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. We now, <clears throat> we now know enough to fantasize realistically about what the alien uh, would be like. And I think that this then sets up polarities in the collective psyche that previously we have only seen at the level of the individual, and this is why I called the lecture Alien Love, because love is a unique expression of individualism. But what the developing archetype of the other 
if you will, the extraterrestrial, because for us the away from the earth is the other. What the developing archetype of the other means and our fascination with it is that collectively for the first time or perhaps for the first time in a long time we are beginning to yearn that's what it's all about and uh, I think that what's happening in religion on a very broad scale is that the previous concerns of salvation and redemption are shifting into the background for the great majority of people and what is driving religious feeling is a wish for uh, contact, a relationship to the other and the alien then falls into place in that role. The alien fulfills it and uh, I believe that if religion survives into the long centuries of the future, this is what will be its compelling concern, an attempt to define a collective relationship with the other that assuages our yearning and our feeling of being uh, cast out, as Heidegger says, cast into matter alone in the universe. In other words, it's as though um, by passing into the psychedelic phase, the space-faring phase, the entire um, species is passing into adolescence and becoming aware of the possibility of something like a sexual completion with an other, with a species which is not human, an idea which had previously been masked for us in our collective prepubescence, where we were self-absorbed. The Freudians call it uh, polymorphically perverse, meaning occupied in the exploration of the ego and the body. And so this culture crisis, which I've talked about in many different ways, but never this way, has this dimension too. It has this uh, psychological, erotic drive for a, uh, a connection with the other. And to sum up what I've said about religion, it's as though the Father God notion were being replaced by the pure alien notion. And the pure alien is, uh, is uh, like the tetramorph. It is, you know, androgynous, hermaphroditic, transhuman. It is all these things which the unconscious chooses to project upon it until we have more information to define what it might actually be for itself, you see. Eventually, this uh, contact will occur, and this is, uh, you know, the we are now in the pubescent stage of forming the yearning, forming an image of the thing desired, and this image of the thing desired will eventually cause that thing to come to be. In other words, man's cultural direction is being touched by this notion of alien love and it comes I think through the rebirth of the use of uh, plant hallucinogens because they seem to be the carriers of this pervasive intellecti which speaks and which can uh, present itself uh, in this particular way. The, the appetite for this fusion is what is propelling the, uh, the energy toward an apocalyptic transformation. It isn't recognized as that in the culture yet, but it is this fascination with the other which propels us forward. But it is not, I, it's not an inevitability. In other words, it's like having the potential to fall in love but then, you know, if there is no one to love, this potential can turn to rancor and, uh, and disillusionment. So what it is, is that we've embarked on a, the exploration of a unique historical moment, which is that for the first time, the issue of the other 
is being fully constellated and dealt with by the species. The question is being asked, are we alone? And though we now focus on that question, we need to think beyond the qu that to what if we are not alone? Then what becomes the next imperative question? It is obviously the exploration of this relationship and uh, it has this erotic character because we will discover as soon as communication is even remotely possible that we are obsessed with it because it becomes very important to know whether or not we are alone. It becomes very important to open a dialogue if any dialogue uh, is possible. And I think that at this stage in what's happening, the facts are secondary to the description of what's going on. In other words, this could slip away from us. It is a potential which has swum near to the historical continuum. And if it is invoked by enough people, it will become a fact. But it could also slip away. We could harden. There are fascist, hyper-techno uh, futures that we could sail toward and realize that would eliminate this possibility of opening to the other. And uh, I'm always trying to define for myself what the historical importance of psychedelics is, because we know, of course, that shaman have used these things for millennia and have plumbed these depths uh, as individuals. But still, I always had this intuition that there was a historical impact of some sort, and I think this is it that actually we are uh, positioned to attempt something which has never been attempted before, which is to open a dialogue as a collectivity with the other and to use that uh, uh, synergy to bootstrap ourselves to some kind of new cultural level. And I think in the... Uh, in the blurb which preceded this talk in the folio, I mentioned uh, that uh, this potential was hidden now in the psyche. There isn't a great deal of talk about it. It only arises at this totally screwball folkloric level. None of the managerial or analytical elements in the society are looking at this at the moment. But I think it is uh, forming and crystallizing, and uh, I think that the peculiar animate quality of psilocybin that I've discussed in other talks is probably a major synergy for this. Um, I mentioned on the radio today that uh, contact with extraterrestrials and voices in the head and logos-like phenomena is not part of the general mythology of LSD. Uh, I mean, certain exceedingly intense individuals on a combination of heroin, methadrine, and LSD may have achieved this uh, intermittently, but it is not something which is attached to the notion of what LSD does to you. With psilocybin, on the other hand, it definitely is. I mean, our survey showed that as people's doses increased, their susceptibility to this phenomenon increased markedly. And so I think the, the issue of contact with the extraterrestrial for large numbers of people has been uh, broached by that phenomenon. And it's very puzzling to people because our expectations are always that we are cells in a vast societal animal and that the news of anything truly important will be conveyed electronically to us and that if flying saucers land, the President and the Secretary General of the United Nations and uh, somebody will convey the word to us. But the challenge of, uh, of the psychedelics is to realize that the potential for the hyper-collectivity, the alien 
the alchemical wedding with the alien, though it is a collective phenomenon, it's inherently tribal, and it will happen as an experience uh, for individuals at the individual level. And this is what's happening. People are uh, in the confines of their own apartments, becoming Magellans of the interior world, and reaching out to this alien thing and beginning to map it and bring back stories that uh, you know can only be compared to the kind of stories that the chroniclers of the New World brought back to Spain at the close of the 14th of, of the 15th century. I mean, cities of gold, insect gods, spaceships, uh, vast wisdom, tremendous wealth, uh, endless wastelands. Uh, we're just beginning to map this area. And many times I've spoken of it as a landscape, and many times I've spoken of it as a confidant, a kind of girl Friday who tells you things. But a, another facet of it is this erotic element, and there's no other word for it because uh, it inspires this feeling of opening and merging that that is in our cultural conditioning, what we associate it with. To distinguish it from ordinary love, I always think of it as L-U-V. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, the kind of love that you get with uh, the alien. And what it means is that the relationship to the alien can be thought of as modeled on the micro-relationships to the other that each of us form through relating to other people. In other words, if you're familiar with the Jungian notion of the conjunctio, this is where two people get together and try to function as alchemical mirrors for each other. And Tantra and Taoist sexual practices, all these things have to do with fusing in, into dyads and uh, what is happening in that situation is that each party to the fact is taking on the quality of the other. In a non-erotic context, that's called becoming what you behold. And we are uniquely susceptible to becoming what we behold. This is why we have always been led into the future uh, by the n nose, by our imaginations, because we dream and then we realize the dreams. The, this fact about our monkeyhood, when put in combination with a relationship with an alien mind, means that we will become what we behold. And this is, in fact, I think, what is happening. Uh, the, the curious intimations of the deepening contact with the other make it seem probable to me that we are in love, but we're just slowly realizing it because we've never been in love before. So that articulating this kind of stuff one person saying it to another and discussing it is actually an attempt to conjure this into being, to call it forth, to make this supposition become fact, because all facts are, are the suppositions of very large numbers of people. And uh, this archetype now hangs in the balance there is much tension about the flying saucer aside from the erotic uh, connotation because the flying saucer represents a tremendous challenge to science, perhaps the ultimate challenge to it. It may be as confounding to science as the resurrection of Christ was to Greek empiricism and Roman imperialism. In other words, the flying saucer is definitely an agent of cultural change. On the level of the machine, it, uh, it bids distress for our most cherished explanatory schema. 
but on the level of the alien as flesh, it presents a much more basic and fundamental challenge because the erotic complex is being redefined by this phenomenon. I was talking to someone and we came up with the idea that uh, we were talking about how many people take LSD and how it's very difficult to get precise numbers on this matter because people don't talk about it but that uh, in the last 15 years sexual researchers have had a field day because people are very very willing to discuss their bizarre sexual peculiarities and to just pour out their hearts to people with clipboards and we know now a great deal about human sexuality and uh, we were suggesting that uh, the taboo is moving the taboo is moving so that as we become more sexually polymorphic and open with each other and less uh, identifying our ego with our sexuality we become very private and constrained and secretive and religious and all these things about our psychic experiences uh, the the drug experiences particularly and he was suggesting this to me as an explanation for why it is so hard to get people to describe their drug experiences why the literature is so barren of any richness of description when the experience is uh, you know the culmination of richness and intricacy and beauty and uh, Though I don't take this idea as gospel, I think it's very interesting. We are much more open with each other sexually and in our process of examining our libidinal consciences in the confines of our own minds. But the taboo now has moved to this interior world where, the, where we have this, uh, this adolescent sensitivity about this developing relationship to the other. Now, I th all these things are elements which are going together to make the emerging human future. And it is a human future that is uh, proceeding exponentially it is not a mere linear propagation of the present because these peculiar factors are impinging on it. Things like psychedelic drugs, the ability to erect large structures in deep space, the presence of the alien logos uh, in the mind of the collectivity, the presence of the cybernetic network that is developing. All these things are going toward a release of man into his imagination. And so far, the cultural engineers have not stressed enough that the erotic element be included in the engineering of the human future. Um, Eric Yanch, who is a good friend of mine, and many of you may know his books, he and I used to argue about space colonies and whether this was a viable way to go. And he sensed this problem by saying to me, but Terence, where will they get nature spirits? How will they indu induce nature spirits to inhabit the space colonies? Well, another way of saying it, a way that brings it much more close to home is how can Eros be invoked in space and carried with us and expanded I tried to do my part to help this process along by spreading the rumor that uh, the Soviet lady cosmonaut sustained five 40-minute orgasms in weightlessness <laughs> and that they were sitting on this information because they didn't want to panic <laughs> but uh, maybe it's true. I'll say it's true. It's true. When the monkeys find out what sex in zero gravity is like, uh, I won't have to make hard pitches like this one. <laughs> Anywho. So let me sum this up by saying that uh, 
there's an emerging zeitgeist of hyperspace which has to do and I call it a zeitgeist of hyperspace because as man leaves the earth another dimension is added and that crude metaphor will reverberate at every cultural level because we will begin to live in a hyperdimensional collectivity not only of earth and space but of information of past and future of conscious and unconscious by navigating between these places on psychedelic drugs and eventually the technological culmination of this is the projection of human consciousness into whatever form it seeks to take and the zeitgeist of hyperspace which is emerging which is heavily freighted with technology and cybernetics and all these things requires that it be consciously tuned to an erotic ideal and I as I said before it's important to articulate the presence of this erotic ideal of the other in or early in order that this process not go sour or slip away from us and leave us with one of the barren futures that some kind of uh, very flat uh, uh, behaviorist or Marxist analysis of history could leave us with this is a chance an opportunity a chance to fall in love with the other and get married and go off to the stars but uh, it's only an opportunity and it is not um, evolutionarily necessary in other words if we only live with the ideal of the other and never find and fuse with the other we will still evolve uh, along whatever pathways lie ahead of us but if the opportunity is seized if we take seriously the experience of the last 10 millennia and complete the modern program of realizing the ideals of the archaic recognizing that what the 20th century really is about is an effort to establish and perfect the ideals of late paleolithic shamanism then we will have integrity in relating to this opportunity and uh, we will have a very peculiar historical adventure which i uh, i cheer for thank you very much <laughs> and i'll answer questions if anybody dares to ask a question <laughs> yes on. a large number of people taking you know, as you refer to LSD versus the dearth of powerful artistic or literary creations coming from that Ellen and I were talking about this at some length over the last month and one suggestion that we had that we might want to comment on is that the intensity and depth and beauty of the experience often far outweighs the technical capability in terms of literature, painting, sculpture of the individual it has. Uh, could not that be a great contribution as opposed to the unwillingness of someone to discuss them, the inability for someone to be able to relate anything but a mere shadow of what he or she has seen or experienced? Well, yes, I mean, I, I think you're right that if you do your best, you can only convey a mere shadow of what's going on. But I don't see people doing their best. I see them doing very little at all. That's the problem. The other thing is, once we were to set to ourselves the task of describing the psychedelic experience, it, it would become more accessible because you know if we each gave our best metaphor and then we all used that metaphor and used it to produce a better metaphor we would eventually retool our language so that we were able to handle these modalities and this will happen historically uh, the the psychedelic experience is a new object for western languages it will be very interesting to see what English, the language of Milton, Chaucer, and Shakespeare, will be able to do with the psychedelic experience. I mean, my God, in William Blake, you get the feeling that English 
could do staggering things with the psychedelic experience, places in Andrew Marvel. Uh, but uh, all this remains to be, to be done. There are certain... Uh, the relationship of the psychedelic experience to literature is a whole field unto itself. I mean, there are certain moments where great literature has passed near it. I don't know how many of you have read Flaubert's Temptation of St. Anthony, but that touches very... I mean, he got it. He got it uh, very, very uh, succinctly. Huisman's, J.K. Huisman's Against the Grain is an amazing novel about an esthete, des assons, a man who is so sensitized to perception that he can't leave his apartments. He has his walls uh, covered in felt, and he keeps the lights very low. He collects uh, Red Dawn when nobody had ever heard of Red Dawn. He buys turtles and puts jewels, has jewels affixed to their backs, and then he sits in a half-lit room and smokes hashish and watches the turtles crawl around on his Persian rugs. And... Uh, <laughs> Let's all go home and do this. <laughs> it's called Against the Grain by J.K. Huisman. Oh, if you've never read Huisman, H-U-Y-S-M-A-N-S. -S. He's a, Against Nature. Sometimes it's called Against Nature. There are several translations, yeah. If you read French, it's called Avobour. Yes. Are there any other questions? Uh, surely. Surely you're challenged by this, yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm curious about it in entering the world and letting in more of the world through the imaginations. And if, if the chemical induction is so necessary, I, I've been growing for vision through dream work myself, and uh, it seems like it's possible, or in sleep, we see a lot of things in time formed in that. There's kind of a slow movement where that seems synchronous with life, or that I can almost feel like that while awake, or um, or hear it, or have it go on in my mind and, and be guided. And I wondered about if that's the kind of connecting with you. Well, I think yes. I think dreaming and states of psychedelic intoxication, possibly the after death state possibly the post-apocalypse state for the collectivity. All these things are related to each other, and certainly dreaming is the natural access point because, uh, because you pay, it's a part of your experience every day. But these places are what's called state-bounded. It's very hard to bring back information. Uh, you have to have a natural inclination or a technique and it doesn't matter whether you're using drugs or yoga or dream manipulation. But yes, it's just a, a matter of exploring the mind by whatever means work. Uh, but I'm, I've seen studies which show that in the deepest part of sleep uh, the, is the high point of the production of endogenous hallucinogens in the human brain, like DMT and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, nevertheless, it's only in the wildest dreams, which are necessarily the most difficult to recover, that you pass into places which are like these uh, DMT and psilocybin intoxications. Yoga makes the claim that it can deliver you into these spaces. I spent some time looking into that, not a lot of time, but uh, people have different proclivities for these altered states of consciousness. I don't have it's very hard to move me off the baseline of consciousness. I am very stolid and set in the here and now. And so drugs work better than anything for me. I scoured India and I could not convince myself that it wasn't a shell game of some sort or that it was as real as the states manipulated by the various schools of New Age psy psychotherapy and that sort of thing. But in the Amazon, uh, 
and in other places where the use of plant hallucinogens is understood and used, I mean, you are conveyed into worlds that are appallingly different from ordinary reality and extremely vivid. The vividness of them cannot be stressed enough. I mean, they are uh, more real than real. And that's something which you sense intuitively. They establish an ontological priority. They are more real than real. And once you get that under your belt and let it rattle around in your mind, then the compasses of your life begin to spin. And you realize that, uh, you know, you're not looking in on it, it's looking in on you. And... Uh, this is a tremendous challenge to the intellectual structures that have carried us so far the last thousand years. I mean, we can do tricks with atoms. There's no question about that, except that these tricks immolate us. But higher order structure, molecules, uh, and leave alone organelles and that kind of thing are just uh, terra, intellectual terra incognito to us. We have no notion of how these things work and what is going on. And yet it is from those levels that the constituent modalities of reality are being laid down. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, you can understand all this fine nuclear chemistry about the atom, and where does it put you if your intellectual, uh, the story you tell yourself about how the world works can't explain to you how forming the wish to close your open hand into a fist makes it happen. And this is the true status of present science. They cannot offer so much as a clue how that happens. They know how muscles contract and ATP, ADP, all that they know. It's the, initial, the initiating phenomenon. What is it that decides, I will close my, my, my hand, and it happens? There is, you know, they know as much about that, perhaps less, than Western philosophy knew in the 12th century. And, and it is at that level, at the level of the body experienced and the mind experienced, that we operate. I mean, you can live in the, in the social and religious system of Hellenistic Greece and offer sacrifice to Demeter, or you can live in 20th century America and watch the evening news, but you should have no faith that you're getting the true story on reality. These are just historical contexts that uh, can only be transcended by the acquisition of uh, gnosis, of knowledge that is experienced as true. And it's hard for people to even realize what I might be talking about because they believe that something like logical consistency or ability to be reduced to mathematical formalism is how you judge the efficacy of an idea. But actually, this is what has led us into this extremely alienated state. It's that we haven't demanded that the stories we tell ourselves about how the world works confirm our direct experience of how it works. And the psychedelic drugs, by focusing attention on the mind-body-brain interaction, are reframing these questions. And not a moment too soon, because the cybernetic and technical uh, capabilities of the society demand that this all be looked at very clearly or we're just going to sail right off the moral edge of uh, things into the abyss. Well, that wanders from the alien love theme. But as I said, all these factors are going to make up uh, uh, the, the uh, adumbration of the present that will become and be the future. Yeah, Ellen. Could you comment further on the interaction between the various sexual yogas and the psychedelic experience or intoxication as tools, I mean, as, as in effect, potential tools for approaching the kind of extraterrestrial eroticism you're talking about? Well, certainly, I mean, you have all kinds of things going on uh, 
when people are having sexual intercourse, the physiological state is very uh, hyped up. There's production of pheromones, all this sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> how far into this can one go? Uh, it's interesting, well, this far. <laughs> one thing I've noticed on psilocybin is that uh, skin contact uh, there is like a, uh, a uh, disappearance of the normal resistance across a membrane, especially if, if there is perspiration, so that two people with large amounts of skin in contact, when both people are loaded on psilocybin, the flow of ions or, you know, the electrophoretic transfer of salts or whatever the proper incantation is, uh, <laughs> you become one one thing and and i'm convinced enough of this that i would suggest to the masters and johnson or whoever has license to do these kind of things that this be tried that if you're serious about validating telepathy here is a very simple experiment and i think that you'd be amazed Taoist sexual practices lay a lot of stress on uh, the generation of unusual substances in the genitals or in the perspiration or which is a theme absent from uh, from uh, Indian yoga but a, a theme picked up in Amazonian shamanism where there is a, a, a lot of stuff about magical forms of perspiration magical objects uh, that are generated out of the body or put into the body of other people. It's interesting, it's not clear to what degree the, uh, in the matter of Taoist uh, alchemy, it appears that there was an erotic control language so that much of what appears to be um, prescriptions for sexual practices are actually recipes for plant uh, combinations. <coughs> because words which were used with sexual connotations were also code words for plants and fungi. The association <clears throat> in the Taoist mind between fungi and feminine genitalia and all this stuff, it's just, it all runs together. The words and the concepts are the same, and this is a prevailing uh, motif of the so-called esoteric schools of Chinese eroticism, meaning the schools where nothing actually appears to be going on but the presence of certain plants and certain objects in a composition indicate that it actually is a, 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 an erotic cryptogram of some sort. Yeah? Uh, could it be seen perhaps that the uh, natural psychedelics that exist on the planet are kind of of love offering from the other t to us, which which we when we accept them as it were, we uh, can develop that bond. Uh, in other words, something which is being sought by the other. Yes. And well, I uh, to that. in the, at this conference in Washington, I spoke about extraterrestrial contact and the relationship to the psilocybe mushrooms. I've mentioned before that uh, psilocin which is what psilocybin quickly becomes as it enters your metabolism, is um, psilocin is 4-hydroxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine. It is the only 4-substituted indole to occur in all of organic nature. Now let this rattle around in your mind for a moment. It is the only 4-substituted indole known to exist on Earth. And it happens to be this psychedelic drug which occurs in about 81 species of fungi, most of which are native to the New World. What I was suggesting to that group of people was that its uniqueness is a chemical signature saying, you know, I am artificial, I have come from outside. And I was suggesting that it was a gene, an artificial gene, carried perhaps by a space-born virus or something which had been brought artificially to this planet and that this gene had insinuated itself into the genome of, uh, 
of these mushrooms. It's an unresolved problem in botany why there is such a tremendous concentration of plant hallucinogens in the New World in North and South America. Africa, which is the continent where man is generally thought to have arisen and gone through his formative cultural uh, development, is the poorest of all continents in hallucinogens. Uh, the New World is very, very rich, and this is why shamanism is so uh, narcotic, as it's called, hallucinogenic shamanism, is so highly developed in the New World. So yes, it seems to me that the fact that the gene, or that the psilocybin compound is chemically unique, the fact that it induces this Logos-like experience, uh, makes me at least entertain the possibility that this is an extraterrestrial contact, that extraterrestrial contact as we have previously conceived it, which is that someone from far away would come in ships and get in touch with us, it doesn't work like that. What it is is that as human history goes forward, we develop the linguistic discrimination to be able to recognize the extraterrestrials that are already insinuated into the planetary environment around us, some of which may have been here millions and millions of years. In other words, space is not an impermeable barrier to life, but there are there is slow seepage, there is genetic material that is transferred across space and time over vast distances. and. Uh, I operationally I deal with the mushroom that way. I, it may well be an adumbration or some slice of the human collectivity, but since it presents itself as the other, I, uh, I treat it as the other and I treat with it as the other. And sometimes, as I said, it's my colleague and sometimes it's my Jewish godfather and sometimes it is my... Uh, what, what Jung called the Soror Mystica, or what my brother Dennis called the Soror Mistress. It, it is, uh, you know, has this erotic connotation to it. But this is uh, all part of the picture, and it all has to do with changing our preconceptions of things, so that an idea such as that a mushroom could be an intelligent extraterrestrial, which is preposterous by one point of view, can be seen to, be, to move from possible to highly probable by simply shifting your language around. And the evidence has been left untouched. The evidence is equally friendly to either point of view because the evidence is so personal. Science is totally impersonal. The empirical evidence that the mushroom is an extraterrestrial is zilch. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, subjective experience of those who have formed a relationship with it is uh, overwhelmingly slanted in the other direction. And this is, you know, here we have then ideas in competition, the evolution of points of view through time. And that's why I say the opportunity should not be missed to uh, open a cultural dialogue about this phenomenon with ourselves, among ourselves, and with the thing itself. It's a unique opportunity. Yes? I would ask you to speculate just for a minute. Um, I, I never speculate. <laughs> just try. <laughs> um, given that we're led by our imaginations into the future, and that facts are indeed suppositions that are agreed on by a large group of people, uh, how many people do you suppose uh, it would take to agree on these facts, and what sort of rituals or ceremonies would be required to align everybody's thinking to agree on specific elements of the invisible landscape to the point where um, it would be possible to retool the language to uh, accommodate the new visions <clears throat> and, um, and to um, take advantage of this opportunity to perfect the uh, paleolithic 
ideals of shamanism? Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a critical 5% or something like that. I mean, political revolutions, they say, are made by 10%. Uh, I think the, the change, what I put it down to, is uh, the emanation of these psilocybe mushrooms throughout society. That, you know, in the last eight years, we have undergone... A, like a, a second Neolithic revolution. The first Neolithic revolution was the invention of agriculture. The second Neolithic revolution was the invention of home fungus cultivation. And suddenly, you know, 20 or 30 species of psilocybin-containing mushrooms, which were previously rarely met forest endemics, or the coprophytic kinds of mushrooms, the ones which grew on the dung of cattle, these things, which all of which had restricted endemic uh, zones of occupation, have become ubiquitous. Stropharia cubensis, uh, the most uh, ubiquitous in the natural state, was before the invention of human cultivation, uh, a rare tropical mushroom. Now it grows from Nome to Tierra del Fuego in every attic, basement, and garage around. And uh, uh, the strategy by which the mushroom conquers society is exactly the same strategy by which the mycelium spreads across a petri dish. It just moves out in all directions. and. Uh, uh, my brother and I wrote the book Psilocybin, the Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide in 1975. It sold 100,000 copies. We had stiff competition from Bob Harris. He wrote a book called Growing Magic Mushrooms or something. Jonathan Ott wrote a book. Gary Menser, uh, Stephen Pollock, uh, spore companies sprang up. Uh, it's very hard to imagine uh, how many people are doing this. Uh, for the delight of my mycological uh, crowd last weekend, I posed the question, uh, if the mycelium spreads through society the way it spreads through bulk substrate or a petri dish, then what phenomenon can we expect in society when the mushroom fruits? meaning when it goes through the ontological transformation where it ceases to manifest its homogeneous, hyphal network form and instead manifests its form which is devoted to sunbathing and sex thrills, which is uh, the mushroom which emerges above the ground. So I'm, I'm very bullish on psilocybin. I think that it is that the word drug is inappropriate, that the model of hallucinogenic drugs that we have um, inherited from our experience with LSD is completely inadequate, that the fact that LSD is our model hallucinogen for doctors and researchers and that kind of thing is only a historical accident. The fact that it was discovered first or characterized first in the laboratory and then millions and millions and millions of people took it because of course it's active in the 100 gamma range where psilocybin is active at the 15 milligram range. So m millions and millions of people were able to be touched by LSD. I don't think that mass drug taking is a good idea. Uh, but I think that we must have a deputized minority, a shamanic professional class, if you will, whose job is to bring ideas out of the deep black water and show them off to the rest of us and perform for our culture uh, some of the cultural functions that shaman perform in pre-literate cultures. I like the plant hallucinogens. I think that, that a true symbiosis is happening there. You see, LSD was a creature of the laboratory. Uh, it was not a creature of the laboratory. It was a thing of the laboratory. Psilocybin is a creature of the forests and fields. It, uh, when man 
propagates it, when we spread it, when it stones us, uh, there is this reciprocal relationship, transfer of energy and information. This is a true symbiosis. Both parties are gaining, nobody is giving up anything. And, uh, you know, we have domesticated many plants and animals. That's not big news. But, uh, you know, this is not a bean or an apple. It isn't even a cat or a dog. It may be smarter than we are. And so the implications of this relationship have to be couched in, in at least human terms. And that's why the erotic uh, metaphor is not inappropriate. Let's see, if psychedelic substances were legal, and this were a, a class in, say, introductory psychedelic appreciation, what do you suppose our first assignment would be? Uh, from me? <laughs> 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 well, I guess I would have you uh, plant some seeds and read some history. And when you had read the history and grown the seeds, and I don't know what they would be, they would be morning glories or the spores of mushrooms or something, uh, when you had assimilated the history and cared for the plant and brought it to its fullest, self-expression of fruitful production of alkaloids, why then you would be at the threshold of uh, your career and I would adjourn the class. <laughs> <laughs> but but n not to be facetious or to follow up that point, history is very important to doing well in the psychedelic experience, at least psilocybin, because it shows you movies of history. It sees us as historical creatures. It has this above everything kind of point of view where it isn't dealing with you in the slice of the moment. It's dealing with the phenomenon of the monkeys over the last millennium. And that's how it sees us. And you can assimilate some of its viewpoint by having a real feeling for, you know, the ancestors, all the people who are dead, the people who went before. I mean, it's really a strange, long, what a long, strange trip it's been, you know? I mean, from, from the cave paintings at Altamira to the doorway of the starship, and uh, now we stand on that threshold hand in hand with this strange new partner, not expected. In the nature of historical change comes the unexpected, and this is what we have on our hands. The problem of the other, the need for the other, the presence of the other, the nature of the other, these are the questions and the concerns that will drive the next uh, uh, order of human becoming. You don't preclude at all the possibility that this, the yearning for the other is just really the yearning for the self, that the other really is an undisclosed self, that, it, that the erotic urge is to unite. No, I don't. In fact, I said at the beginning the the nature of the archetype is being set now in the light of scientific knowledge about how it's possible that there is other intelligence in the universe. And it's a combination of our need for connection and science giving its blessing to this form of expressing that need that is creating the phenomenon of the potential for alien love. But you see, we don't know what the self is. I mean, you know, if you, if you take seriously Buddhism, which says that everything is bodhi-mind, well then that means that there could be extraterrestrials, and if it's true that everything is bodhi-mind, they are an aspect of the self. The word self is as great a mystery as the word other. There's just a polarity between two mysteries. And then, you know, the, the thin, thin myths that are spun to hold you there 
without freaking out the myths of science and religion and the horoscopes and the shamanizing all these things but a, a polarity between the mystery of the self and the mystery of the other and a mystery is not to be confused with an unsolved problem a mystery is by its nature mysterious it will not collapse into solution and uh, we're unfamiliar with that kind of thing. We think that if there's a mystery, why well, you just hire a bunch of people, whatever <laughs> kind of people, and they get it straightened out and issue a report, and that's that. But this only works for trivia. And what's important, our hearts, our souls, our hopes, our expectations, uh, are completely mysterious to us. And so how must they appear then to the other, if it truly is other. So we need to cultivate a sense of mystery. The mystery is not only in the other, it is in us. And this reverberates again with what I said about how we become what we behold. History is turning suddenly mysterious here in the post-quantum uh, physics, post-modern phase. This was not expected. Uh, the 19th century, the early 20th century, they didn't realize this is what they were pointed into. Although some people, the pataphysicians, the surrealists, they saw what was coming. But here we are. Yeah. Uh, in the discussion earlier of uh, how the mushroom was likely seeded from afar reminded me of directed panspermia. Uh, the idea that life itself was seeded. Yeah. I, I, both sent down here together. I should have mentioned that theory because it's the best support I have for the idea I was putting forth. What's being mentioned is uh, a theory, the panspermia theory, which was formulated by Cyril Panampurama and, and uh, uh, Crick, who, uh, who was the discoverer with James Watson, Francis Crick, of DNA. And they are proposing a much more radical theory than what I put forth. Uh, at least in terms of relative to biology, they're saying that prebiotic molecules arise in the greatest numbers in deep space, not on the surfaces of planets. That planets are only secondarily and at a late stage in the development of complex polymers and prebiotic compounds do uh, the surfaces of planets become uh, where the action is. I am not saying that. What I'm harking back to is I'm sure you all know the old uh, adage that we each are made of stars, that the atoms in your body were once cooked in the hearts of stars. This is true, but it, a, a unremarked uh, uh, accompanying necessity of that fact would be that there must therefore be some atoms in your body which were not cooked in the hearts of stars, but which were part of the planets which circled around those stars uh, before they exploded. My point being that not all of this material that is circulated in the galaxy has been through something as violent as nuclear burning at the heart of a star. When stars go nova, their planets are blown to pieces and biotic material that has evolved on those planets is injected into the general cosmic soup of circulating material. And that is m more my idea of what the spore strategy may have originally been about. It was forms of life which evolved on very, in very harsh environments where a spore could survive, but seeds, for instance, couldn't. And we were talking at this mushroom conference this weekend about how if you want, if you have some mushroom spores and you want to preserve them, the way you do it is you create an atmosphere as much like that of deep space as possible. Ideal is total vacuum at minus 40, at minus 60 degrees centigrade. And uh, then they'll last virtually forever. At any, at any lower temperature, uh, they will slowly degrade. So I envision mushrooms or, or spore-bearing life forms antecedent to mushrooms evolving in very harsh environments where then actually uh, space was a medium 
through which they could migrate. And of course, this happens over very long periods of time, but if you think that the galaxy is roughly 100,000 light years from edge to edge, if something were moving only one one hundredth the speed of light, which now that's not a tremendous speed that presents problems to any advanced technology. If something were moving one one hundredth the speed of light, uh, it could cross the galaxy in ten million years. Well, there's life on this planet a billion point eight years old. That's uh, 1,800 times longer than 10 million years. So, looking at the galaxy on those time scales, you see that the percolation of, star, of, of spores between the stars is a perfectly vi viable strategy for biology. And we know that the casing of spores is a very electron-dense material. The, it's as electron-dense as many metals. Global currents form uh, generating sub-superconducting -super or superconducting states on the surface that make them even more resistant to radiation. And they, we know that spores are light enough that Brownian motion and uh, uh, convection and this sort of thing, definitely they percolate even into the high stratosphere. And there, highly in inter uh, energetic events are going on at a fairly regular pace, sufficient that we can calculate that a certain number of these, small for each spore shedding, but large in the total context of fungi on the planet, these spores percolate right out uh, of the gravitational field and then are subject to larger forces. So uh, it's radical to suggest this but it's only because the uh, empirical evidence is thin, the logic of the case is well-founded. What is on much shakier ground, of course, is the idea that the mushroom is an intelligent life form. And that's my special obsession and province, and most people say I'm welcome to it. But uh, it's very interesting, in a book called uh, extra uh, perspectives on scientific communication with extraterrestrials or something like that. Anyway, a book by Punam Purama, there's an article by R.N. Bracewell, who's an astrophysicist, talking about the logic of searches for intelligent life. And he concludes that no matter what kind of life form you are, no matter what kind of technology you have, if you are seriously going to search space by physically sending probes from one star to another, then the only strategy which would work would be what's called a Van Neumann machine, meaning a machine which can reproduce itself so that the machine leaves its parent star and then it, or, or four of these machines are sent out in four opposed directions from a parent star. At a certain distance from the parent star, each machine replicates. Then you have eight machines, and at double that distance, they replicate again, and you have 16 machines, and so on. The notion being that only by this process of replication can you cover all bets, and that probably then what you do is you send a message which says, we are searching the galaxy by an exhaustive uh, means, and uh, if you read this message, please call the following toll-free number, <laughs> and we will then initiate contact. And only by this means could you hope to uh, have contact with all the worlds in the galaxy. And this makes it very important to understand what the message is that the mushroom conveys. The Mandayans, who were an obscure religious cult of uh, Gnostics in the Middle East, of very long survivability, have this very interesting idea. They believe that at the end of time, what they call the secret Adam will come to Earth. 
and the secret Adam is a messiah-like figure, but what he does is he builds a machine which then transmits all the souls back to their hidden source in the All-Father outside of the machinery of cosmic fate. And this notion of the Messiah building a machine is very interesting. It's conceivable that if there is an extraterrestrial message in our environment, it is a message to build some kind of device so that a less tenuous form of communication can be opened up. Uh, and Bracewell makes this case. To him, this is just inherent in the logic of the situation. And I suppose it would be an interesting branch of logic, the logic and the protocols of extraterrestrial contact. What can we define about contact that is so basic that whatever form of life and intelligence you were, you would have to flow along those creodes. Uh, this is probably an undeveloped field at this point, but it certainly uh, could be done. It's like alternative physics. We need alternative theories of social contact and, uh, and uh, social contract making in the event that we meet an extraterrestrial. This is a fertile theme in science fiction, the logic of contact, how to make it without giving away too much and yet not get anything out of it. It's poker, but the stakes are very high. We're talking about the survivability, viability, and evolutionary fates of species, if not entire planets. Yeah, you, you talked about the collapse of the distinction between inner and outer space. Right. And what would, how would you, would you go into that more? Well, I, it, the the distinction of inner and outer space is is rooted in association of the self with the body, and I think as the <coughs> self moves out into the ocean of electronic uh, consciousness, and also as we explore the erotic dimensions with the other that I've indicated tonight. Uh, this identification between self and body will become secondary in a way that identification between king and self has become rather secondary over the last 5,000 years. I mean, we don't even have a king. We seem to manage without one. It's conceivable we could manage without a body as well. These are just ways that loyalty is transferred toward uh, forms of cultural uh, concrescence validated by local languages. Anything else? Yes. Um, it seems that, that you talk as if our humanity is on like a threshold of a new age and that um, maybe through contact the aliens will help us like cross this threshold. Maybe you might want to elaborate more. Well, I definitely think we're on that that uh, there is a process that has been long underway that has been gaining momentum since its very beginning. Uh, it's the process which formed the planet, which called life out of the ocean, which called higher animals out of lower animals, uh, which called uh, humanity out of the primates, and which called history out of tribal, sacral, timeless existence. And what it is leading toward is some kind of uh, apocalyptic, transformative flowing together of everything that is beyond our language system. It's the umbilicus of being. It's where it's all tied together, and therefore it's very hard to describe it. I think that all of our science and our religion and our history, these are uh, patterns thrown across a limited set of dimensions by the hyperdimensional fact of a certain object at the end of history toward which we are moving, to which we are being drawn. I think that most things about man are mysterious and that what is happening to us is mysterious. 
the sudden explosive development of the neocortex is entirely out of context with what we know about the rates of evolution that go on in other species and previously went on in the primates. Now it's been very fashionable in the past, you know, I don't know, 50 years or something to uh, think that it's all very humdrum somehow. And yet this is just everybody, every ideological system that has been granted the status of uh, being the official view of reality has always proclaimed that it had everything nailed down but the last 5% and their best people were working on that. But I think that we are, for all that we know, we know practically nothing. And that though I am not in any sense of the well, not in any sense, but in most senses I am not religious. I think that religious thinking about the transformation of the world is more on the right track than the notion that the laws of physics will always be what they are, the laws of biology will always be what they are, and we're all just going to go along and things are going to get worse and worse or better and better, but that there are no surprises I think that we do not see what's going on. One of the reasons I like to make this argument about the mushroom and the extraterrestrial and all that is just to show people that maybe this isn't true, but look how you can see things differently. If things can be seen that differently, how many ways can they be seen differently? And to try and get people to realize, to stop waiting for the president to enlighten you. In other words, stop waiting for uh, history and the stream of historical events to make it clear to you. You have to take seriously the notion that understanding the universe is your responsibility because the only understanding of the universe that will be useful to you is your understanding. It doesn't do you any good to know that somewhere in some computer there are tensor equations which perfectly model or perfectly don't model something that's going on. And we have all tended to give away ourselves to official ideologies and to say, well, I may not understand, but someone understands. But the fact of the matter is, only your own understanding is any good to you. I mean, because it's you that you're going to live with, and it's you that you're going to die with. And as the song says, you know, the last dance you do, you do alone, and you want to be in good company <laughs> then. So... Uh, it's very, it's very important to, uh, to cultivate this aspect of yourself and to be with it. Uh, I don't know what the transformation means, this rushing together of everything, but I think without knowing what it means, you can convince yourself that it's there, it's just nobody has chronicled it or no official agency has pointed out that things are developing faster and faster. Things are growing together faster and faster. Connections are being formed faster and faster. The evolution of language, technology, understanding of the self, these things are just spinning into a tizzy and uh, it will not go away. It will go through, it will break through to something else and we may have to shed the present human guiding image, we may have to shed the monkey body, we have to be open, very open. What is happening on this planet if you stand off by a nearby star and look at it is there is information loose on this planet a swarm, a gene swarm of replicating information which has become so complexified that it now generates swarms of epigenetic information, meaning books, architectures, mythologies, uh, all of these things. And information is liberating itself. We, and what is that? And what does that mean? You know, the Gnostics had the idea that uh, God's body had been scattered through the universe as light and that the purpose, the salvational uh, 
uh, imperative was to gather the light together and get it out of this universe and transmit it back to the modality of its uh, essence and uh, uh, that's a good metaphor for, for what is going on but no one understands it I think but we can understand aspects of it we are lagging there is enough visible that we should be saying more about what's happening and I don't hear that being said. Maybe it's being said privately. Maybe it's a, a taboo subject. Perhaps these, the attraction for some people of these lectures is that they somehow violate taboos, that impossible things are being said. Maybe, maybe not. But impossible things need to be said because impossible things are happening and you don't want to miss it. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you about this. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.